Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Amos 3 3, easy verse to remember. Can two walk together except they be agreed? I'm going to put this up on the screen here. Uh, this is our Wednesday night uh, discussion. This passage here has been the text for many sermons in which virtually all, if not all, present doctrine as the evil which causes division among Christians. The typical approach uh, suggests that doctrine makes it hard or impossible for Christians to walk or to work together. One illustration that's been used a lot of times it speaks of a, a 2,000 square mile area in China in which only two Christian families lived. One family believed in water baptism by immersion, and the other uh, believed in water baptism by sprinkling, and as a result, they never met or they never had any fellowship together. The conclusion drawn from this human illustration, whether it is true or not, is that doctrine is so divisive Christians should seek for areas of agreement and avoid areas of doctrinal disagreement. This suggested meaning uh, neither parses the verse, nor does it deal with the context, yet many so-called Christian organizations urge their speakers to not bring up doctrinal subjects so as to not to offend anybody uh, in the audience. Of course, doctrine is divisive. It divides truth from error. Is it not our mission, our responsibility, to proclaim God's truth rather than dish out some kind of drivel that neither offends nor nourishes those who listen? 2 Timothy 2.15, uh, study to show thyself approved unto God. Everybody's, everyone's familiar with the verse. 1 Timothy 4.16, take heed unto the doctrine, continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. The text in Amos here is, can two walk together except they be agreed? The word walk is an imperfect tense, uh, not speaking of the beginning or the ending of the action, but only a walk with no end in view. Nothing in the word itself indicates the purpose nor the subject of the walk. The word except is the translation of a Hebrew word, meaning the walk has been totally negated, but it is followed by the word agreed in the perfect tense, speaking of a new walk that's now been ar arranged by decree and design. A walk with every detail decreed, designed, and controlled by God. A walk that never ends. Our Lord declared that the scriptures are those which speak of Him, just as this verse does. It is. It is not speaking of doctrinal difficulties, but of the wonder of His grace and that He has ordained for us a never-ending walk with Him. Here is a beautiful statement of God's love for us and His decree of redemption to send His Son to die in our place that our walk with Him, which had been broken by sin, be established by His decree never to be broken again. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. As we studied through Romans, we saw that therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Before we look at the context of the Amos passage, Let's just stop for a minute and think about our God. We, as Christians, believe in the one and only God, the sovereign monarch of eternity who spoke the worlds into existence. He is the one who said, let there be light, and there was light. He swept the dust from his workshop and placed the stars in their orbits. He created the heavens with billions of galaxies and billions of stars in each galaxy Words are not able to express the majesty, the power, and the sovereignty of the one almighty, eternal God who created the heavens and the earth. We understand fully the words of the psalmist. What is man that thou art mindful of him? And we find it almost impossible to believe that we are to him the most precious and the most important of all his works. 
the center of his constant care, uh, concern and control. Oh, he's got to be worried about uh, much more important things than me. For many folks, the, the glory and the majesty of the sovereign God who created the heavens and the earth has blinded their eyes to the grace of this God who not only is the one true God, but is, is actually decreeing and controlling every single event in His creation as well as every detail and event in our lives. Is it reasonable to believe that the God of eternity who so loved us that He gave His only begotten Son to become man, be made sin, and die as our substitute so that we are made the righteousness of God in Him? That the God who paid such a price, the death of His Son, for us would leave us to our own devices? The same God who deals with the immensity of His creation is the God who numbered the hairs of our heads? From the movements of far-off galaxies to the, the fall of the sparrow, our God is in absolute control of every event and every detail in His creation, as well as every event and every detail of our lives. Stop and think for a moment. It costs God nothing to create billions of stars, but because of His love for us, it cost Him the life of His only begotten Son to redeem us. It is inconceivable that God, after paying such a price for us, would leave the simplest detail in our lives to fickle fate, the wiles of the devil, or the decisions of our finite minds. Going back to the context of our passage in, in Amos, will a, a lion roar in the forest when he has no prey? Will a young lion cry out of his den if he have taken nothing? Verse 4. The scientist or the evolutionist looking at the facts may propose the hypothesis that after thousands of years some younger lions began to realize that their parents and their ancestors were skinny, emaciated, and starving. Uh, these, these younger lions, at least some of them, might reach the conclusion that this was true because the lions were frightening the prey away by roaring. The smart thing would be not to roar so as not to scare their prey and, and that way they would have plenty to eat. So over the years, more and more younger lions didn't roar until after they had taken their prey. As a result, of course, because of the survival of the fittest, lions no longer roared until after they had taken their prey. Anyone who believes that is a fool. The hunting lion does not roar until he has taken his prey because God created and designed him that way. God is pointing out in the context that our walk in every detail is designed and decreed by God and He is involved in every detail of our lives and the environment in which we live more than, than, more than He is with lions. Uh, not only has He pointed out in this verse the lion doesn't roar until he has taken prey, but this is also true of the young lion still in the den. Not something he learned, not something taught or acquired, but instilled by the Sovereign God. He ordained our walk as well as that of the lion. In the same way, there is design and control in the fall and in the capture of the bird, verse 5, or the warning trumpet blown in the city, verse 6. All of these things are by the design and the purpose of, of the Sovereign God, even the evil in the city. We can rest in the grandeur of this truth that in a much greater way, all things, every detail and every event in our lives is by the design and in the control of our loving Heavenly Father. Knowing this, is it not strange that we act like the heathen? Jeremiah 10.2, Thus saith the Lord, Learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. You know, it's as common for Christians as well as for non-Christians to speak of Mother Nature as the cause of storms and floods, etc. You know, it's, I doubt you. Uh, pray for those in Florida. Is it reasonable to believe that the God who numbered the hairs on our head allows this Mother Nature to determine the thunderstorm or the tornado? Is nature some sort of God? 
Is it, is it the normal results of fixed laws of creation? No. Nature is that which God has established. Nature is not what man has decided or observed over many years. It's not the result of established laws of the universe, but is the operation of the sovereign God in our environment. Not a raindrop falls, nor a wind blows, but by the decree and the control of our God. You know, it bears repeating, it costs the sovereign God nothing to create billions of stars. But dearly beloved, it, it cost him the life of his only begotten son to redeem us. The Lord made this clear when he spoke to the man sick of, of the palsy. Son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee, and was charged with blasphemy. Remember his, his simple reply, whether whether is it easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and take up thy bed and walk? It cost him nothing to say, Take up thy bed and walk. But it cost him everything to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee. In all of God's vast creation, we who belong to him, we, who are his own and cost him the most, are the most precious to him and are always under his control and direction. There is more scripture, and in fact, the major content of God's word speaks of his interest, his, his direction, his control of every single event in his creation from the rise and fall of nations to the fall of the sparrow. You know, to really grasp this truth, to believe and trust in his care, his control, protection, and direction in all things, every event, big or small, every illness, every affliction, every sorrow, every pain, results in the peace that passes understanding. Oh, how much we miss when we put our trust in something other than our God. You know, for example, uh, stocks, uh, bonds, uh, money, job, relationship. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. 1 John 3, 1. Look, I love you all. I truly do. I hope all of you are well. We pray for you constantly. Rest in Him. Until next time. Thanks for watching.